Good afternoon. We, we still have a great program ahead for the rest of the day. And uh, again, this is one that is very close to me, a look at, a look at the special court for Sierra Leone. I'll, I'll save the introductions for our moderator, but I do just want to, to recognize I've worked with most of the people on this panel. Judge Thompson, one of our judges, of course, you know the, re you, the rest will be introduced, but I did want to, to make sure it was great that Judge Thompson could take a busy, take out, come out of his very, very busy schedule and join us here today. And of course, he sat on two cases before the special court for Sierra Leone. And so we are very, very honored to have him here with us today. But again, I get to introduce someone that needs no introduction, which makes my job very, very easy. And so I will now turn it over to Bill Chavez, the moderator of this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon, everybody. This is the uh, third of the sessions on the special court for Sierra Leone. We heard about the Charles Taylor trial um, last night. We heard at lunch from David Sheffer about the establishment of the court. And this afternoon, we're going to reflect on some of the issues around the operation of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, looking back from the perspective of 10 years of operation. This is always the most dangerous session, the one <laughs> after lunch, where everybody's well fed. And those of you, of course, many of us are used to going to international meetings where people are suffering from various forms of jet lag and sleep deprivation and so on. I was at a conference recently where someone dozed off in the back of the hall and uh, started to snore and it was very, very disruptive, much worse than the odd mobile phone call going off. And so the, the speaker turned to the person who was sitting next to this fellow who was snoring and said, would you mind giving him a nudge and getting him to stop snoring? And he said, you're the one who put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> so, well. We're going to uh, do the session rather like the, the session this morning that Michael Scharf uh, uh, chaired, where I'm going to uh, raise issues about the operation of the Special Court for Sierra Leone and ask the panelists uh, to intervene. If they wish, they don't all have to uh, speak to every point, uh, and also to give them a chance to speak to other issues that may not arise. But I think that if we have time in the various uh, subjects that I'm going to cover, uh, I will get to, to them. Uh, I think some of the panelists have already been adequately introduced. David Sheffer, uh, most not uh, notably earlier uh, during his wonderful keynote speech at lunchtime, and I think uh, Ambassador Stephen Rapp was also introduced yesterday evening. I want to say a, a few words of introduction about the others. Uh, Judge uh, uh, Justice Bankley Thompson, uh, who is the, the serving the judge on the Special Court for Sierra Leone, who has graced us with his presence here. Uh, distinguished jurist from Sierra Leone, um, uh, has a doctorate from Cambridge University, uh, worked as a high court judge for several years in Sierra Leone, and then uh, changed careers in a sense, uh, becoming an uh, academic uh, here in the United States. And he's, he was a uh, had an academic career for many years, uh, then appointed to the Special Court for Sierra Leone uh, in 2002 and served there throughout much of the uh, life of the court as a member and for a time presiding judge of trial chamber uh, number one. Uh, Raymond Brown, who is uh, uh, more on the defense side, and this too is uh, very important perspective to add to uh, a conference that is uh, just a little bit uh, uh, top-heavy with prosecutors, if I may say so <laughs> politely, <laughs> inevitably. <laughs> and uh, Raymond, of course, worked at the Special Court for Sierra Leone's Defense Council in the Morris Callan trial. Um, we were talking earlier, he, this was the trial of the Revolutionary United Front, and Morris Callan was the second defendant uh, to be convicted uh, his co-defendant received, I think, 52 years, and Morris Kalan got off light with 30 years of uh, sentence. So um, that's a tribute, um, no doubt, to the advocacy skills of, uh, of Raymond. And then uh, finally, last but not least, uh, Binta Mansare, who has a 
uh, like the other speakers, a biography, but hers is about six or seven years out of date, I think, because Minta is uh, currently serving as the registrar of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, which is the, the head of the registry, one of the three uh, organs of the court, and uh, uh, she has, has fulfilled that role for two years as the, as the registrar, and prior to that was the acting registrar, and prior to that as the deputy registrar. So they, there's information about all of the speakers uh, in, the, in the brochures that have been distributed, and I, and I won't belabor that. So let's turn now to the work of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Um, this morning, uh, Ambassador uh, Hans Carell, in his wonderful talk, um, touched on the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia. Um, and he alluded to difficulties with them, and I think Hans basically said, don't follow this model again. Um, they, we have here, actually, aside from the International Criminal Court, five international criminal tribunals that are represented by, by prosecutors. So two of them are joined at the hip, so to speak, the International Criminal Tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Not only are they, they joined, they have similar instruments for their operation, but they're joined in their conclusion in the sense that they will be reunited again um, uh, in the residual mechanism that's being established. The other three all have peculiarities, all have differences, and David Sheffer spoke about some of the differences involved in the creation of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. So if we accept uh, Hans Carell's comment that we shouldn't really follow the model of the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia, uh, should we follow the model of the Special Court for Sierra Leone? Is it a better model? Uh, how does it look now uh, from 10 years of operation uh, as something to be emulated, perhaps not in whole, but perhaps in part? Are there aspects of it that actually work rather well uh, and, and serve as a model for us? So uh, let me ask perhaps uh, Justice Mankole Thompson, would you like to speak to that first? Well, um, let me begin by saying that some judges refuse to pontificate on matters which the properly believe might fall within the jurisdiction of social scientists. I am one such judge, and on matters of this nature, I tend to speak with a considerable amount of judicial circumspection. But I, I certainly think that um, there is a consensus among academics, among professionals, um, international lawyers and judges that indeed of the Special Court for Sierra Leone can be regarded as a model for international criminal justice. And uh, I, the literature that I have read convinces me that uh, the court has done a very good job. And speaking again judicially, I would assess the performance of the court from uh, the perspective of certain criteria, one, the compliance with the court's mandate, both in terms of its terms of reference and to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility for serious violations of international humanitarian law and say and loan law, and also in terms of its temporal jurisdiction, its personal jurisdiction, and also its subject matter jurisdiction. I mean, I was there as one of the, the judicial gatekeepers of the court's work and activities, and I'm sure that there were times when um, we had to do a lot of judicial soul searching as to whether we were following with much scrupulousness the mandate of the court. I also think we can measure the performance of the court in terms of its, um, the adherence to its statute. We, the judges, meticulously studied and digested the statute. And again, in a gatekeeping role, we made sure that uh, nothing was done to infringe the entrenched provisions of the statute and that at 
in everything that we did, the principle of legality was paramount. Again, I would also think that another criterion one would use would be the overall compliance with the court's rules of procedure and evidence. Again, these were modeled scrupulously on the ICTR and we made sure that we were not departing from established procedures. Um, amendments, the court had the power to amend its rules of procedure and evidence. I was one of those judges taking the position that a court of such a character that exercised both legislative and judicial functions should be very careful when it's um, exercising its legislative functions not to tend to act out of expediency because a rule hasn't worked in court, therefore you go to the legislative workshop and there try to. So that was another aspect which was very important for us. And I think we, we did a fairly satisfactory job out of that. Again, another criterion would be the quality of the court's jurisprudence, both in respect of its interlocutory decisions and its final decisions and judgments. It may surprise you to know that uh, the court was confronted with a plethora of interlocutory issues. Uh, there was hardly any time to sleep. The moment we finished giving a decision on an, an interlocutory matter, the next morning, some defense counsel or the prosecution was coming up again with some further interlocutory issue. And we, something like 400 decisions were given on interlocutory matters that never were tested on appeal. So the trial chamber's decisions on those subjects remain the law, whether we were right or wrong, but that's because we assume that that's law. I remember that we tried in our own way to add to the existing jurisprudence of other international tribunals on the law uh, regarding uh, indictments, the framing of indictments. We thought what we were doing was purely experimental, so uh, we were very cautious about defective indictments. I mean, having approved the indictments, we were making sure that we're not doing anything wrong. So there were times when we did extensive research to be able to frame new principles that should govern the framing of indictments. We were in for precision, conciseness, and avoidance of language that would raise such problems of duplicity or multiplicity of vagueness. And I think, um, Mr. Moderator, we could also say that in terms of consistency with established principles of international criminal law that had been expounded and developed by other tribunals, I think we, generally speaking, the Special Court for Sierra Leone did adhere in a flexible way to the doctrine of judicial precedence. Even though we made it clear that we were not going to follow slavishly the decisions of all the tribunals, yet we did have regard to the doctrine of judicial precedent, and particularly when we could test those decisions in terms of logic and that they are settled authorities. For example, there were areas of the law that were so settled that we could not be unduly creative or innovative without upsetting the judicial apple cart. So that was another area where we, we focused. We were very, very much careful. And um, I, I want to just produce the empirical evidence that this was a model court because of the meticulousness. Another criterion that we, use, we could use is the conduct of the trials. 
were the trials conducted fairly, impartially, and in accordance with established rules of procedure and evidence? I would say, generally speaking, the where. I mean, and I would place this at something like an A level. We did struggle, you know, to maintain that because that was seen as one of the core values of the judicial culture. Again, there was the other aspect of it, expeditiousness. That, of course, was something that we thought was a difficult um, issue because we always had to balance expeditiousness with the conflicting values of fairness, impartiality, and regard for established rules of procedures. We decided how to balance these values. But I think on the whole, uh, we, those cases were disposed of expeditiously. Having regard to the, the, the number of witnesses called by both sides, both adversarial parties, and uh, I would also add two more criteria to two more criteria to the to my list: the full recognition and application by the court of the doctrine of equality of arms. This was a court that recognized that there should be equality of arms between the adversarial parties. We were often criticized for this, that after all, it's the prosecution that has this high burden and standard of proving the case against the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. So why bother about the application of the doctrine of, the, of equality of arms? But somehow, we thought some uh, our judicial intuitions compelled us to support this. And I think the special court is uh, renowned for being the only tribunal that has an independent defense office within the registry. And finally, let me end on this note, and I probably might have an opportunity to uh, make another contribution. I think it can be said without much fear of contradiction, and I only would, uh, be, I would like to say that I would only like to see the records to, to, to even accept that I'm wrong, that justice of the special court was administered relatively inexpensively in my respectful judgment, it was justice administered according to the principle of least cost. Ambassador Brown, Yeah, please. if I could just jump in from a, from a personal point of view. I was at, uh, in Freetown for, for almost three years, but it followed uh, six years in, in Arusha. So I saw two of these institutions and, and, and worked within them. And, and they both, I think, uh, had, had great success, and, and the reason that they were created and why they were created, I think David shed light on that in terms of uh, the political situation and the possibilities that were really available at the time. Uh, but I, uh, in, in a comparative sense, uh, really uh, appreciated the difference in Freetown, that we were at the scene of the crime, that I was able to get to know and, and spend time with people that had experienced these crimes. Of course, in Arusha, we would get on the beach craft, which would fly every week, and, and we could go over to uh, and make visits uh, to Rwanda. But it wasn't the same as, as living in the country. And, and the fact that we had, uh, we had this uh, mixed constitution with a, with, uh, with a substantial number of the people that we were working with and senior positions and other positions who were from the country, uh, at, the, at the Rwanda Tribunal, at least initially, the only people that came from Rwanda were in the interpretation area. Eventually, we added a few attorneys and investigators. But we had more than 60% of our people in the court that were from, from Sierra Leone. 
and I know it was of immense value to us in investigations and witness protection that we had Sierra Leone police officers who, who came from different parts, who came from, from different ethnic and, and regional and, and religious sorts of backgrounds. And, and this, I think, informed us enormously in, in, in knowing who to believe and, 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 and who to trust, who was, uh, who was uh, seeking benefits from us uh, uh, in a selfish way and who really wanted to cooperate with justice. And, uh, and they benefited, I know. I remember uh, when several of them then went on, some of the investigators uh, moved on to work in the UN and in, in uh, Sudan. They were talking about how much they had gained and uh, mm -hmm. by, by working with internationals. So I, I think that that mixing together was an enormous value that we had at the court and that we, uh, it was something that I think needs to be, to be emulated uh, elsewhere. Uh, the question I suppose is, will it be? And I know I, I'm, as I travel uh, and deal with a variety of situations, the question of whether, uh, particularly if it's a pre-2002 situation where the ICC can't be involved or some other situation where you, you want to go well beyond what the ICC is doing, people are saying, should we do the special court model? And, and frankly, part of the, con the difficulty, uh, of course, was the voluntary contributions. And in the end, uh, what certainly a less expensive organ than the other courts but is, if you add up all the figures, and we've been involved in raising them and, and dealing with the budget, I mean it is uh, close to about $250 million that the court has spent uh, for, for finishing about 10 people in trial, one of whom died before the judgment was rendered, but about $25 million a copy. And when we go to other places and say, let's do this, people say, there's no way we can come up with those kinds of sums. We have to find a more economical way to do it. Uh, as you probably have read in the, in the last days, and we've been involved in it, uh, uh, the new government in, in Senegal under Maki Sall, after a lot of foot dragging with President Wad, has finally agreed to proceed with the case against Hissen Habre, who's been living in, uh, uh, in Senegal now for 22 years, and whom the African Union in 2006 asked Senegal to try in the name of Africa. Now the new government is proceeding. Uh, we're looking at a budget of around $12 million and a court that will be based on an international agreement between the African Union uh, and Senegal, the precedent that David talked about. Uh, so, and there'll be a couple judges coming from the international level, but it will be a court within the Senegalese system with the pay scales and the expectation and the system being largely consistent with what's happening in, in, in that country. Now, can, when it, can it be done for that? I, I, I think it can be. Many people think that's, that's even a, a rich budget. But I think in the future, we'll see, uh, we'll see probably uh, some of the lessons of the special court learned in the sense of the importance of mixing international and national personnel. But I think the direction will go to a greater extent to build it within the national system. Uh, though, of course, we could have, again, the challenges that we have in Cambodia. But there are ways around that, like in Bosnia, where initially uh, we had a majority of international judges, and then they were phased out. So I, I think we've learned lessons here, but uh, they're lessons that, uh, I mean, we, this has been a great success, uh, and we need to, to look at the very positive things that have occurred here and, and build on it, but build it to, to, at the right size. Thank you. Just before uh, giving the floor to Raymond, Someone who has a blue Audi station wagon outside, <laughs> you're about to be towed. <laughs> Please. Um, I think um, I might add a slightly discordant note to today's conversation. Um, David, thank you anyway for inviting me. Uh, because I think that we're at actually a critical transformative moment. Um, and I think that the project of challenging impunity um, has been the subject of some premature declarations of triumph. Um, and I say that um, especially in fire, inspired further by the comments of Ambassador Carell this morning because I believe that the question of adequate resources for Defense Council is a serious, serious problem beyond the question of equality of arms. I think certainly in the two institutions I've been involved with, the International Criminal Court and Sierra Leone, um, it raised its head in difficult ways. And I think uh, it cannot be ignored. Um, let me just take a, a brief step back. Um, I was in Kampala in 2010 because my wife Wanda, who is my co-counsel in Sierra Leone and with me in the, in the International Criminal Court, where we represent victims from the Darfur, represent the first recognized, were in uh, Kampala where I was sitting uh, having lunch with David Crane and a woman joined us and asked us uh, how we knew each other. And I began the most impartial 
uh, disinterested description of the Cologne trial. About two minutes into it, David tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're arguing the defense for Morris Cologne. So I will try not to be an advocate in that sense, but I have no reason to disagree with the claims that, that much of what's done by prosecutors in this area is God's work, but by any theological structure, I can understand God cares about the defense function as well. Um, it is a function um, that I think is not fully appreciated, is often decried by voices in the public space that should know better, um, and I think it's important for me to be in places like this where the people who understand that function. But, for example, we went to Sierra Leone. I'd been trying cases domestically for 25 years, some pretty complex cases commercially and in white-collar law. Uh, my wife who was much, much younger but had similar experience somehow. Um, we had also been teaching international criminal law in Cairo and other places for some time and knew the substantive law, but we were faced with about four months prior to the beginning of trial. We were substitute counsel with thousands of documents, which by the way, David showed some pretty bad violations by those Ekabok guys from Nigeria. Um, but we had to absorb it all quickly. And uh, when we got to Freetown, when I went the first time, uh, a problem that proved to be endemic, and many of these were problems that came out in Judge Cassisi's report. I mean, for three defense teams, uh, three defense units, for the CDF and the RUF um, and the Armed Forces Group, there were three sets, three defendants, three teams, nine groups, one vehicle. Um, there were other kinds of problems. We had very few interpreters. We didn't have access to resources. I mean, we were scuffling. And what I agree with Professor Sheffer is an evolving and extraordinarily complex area of law. I mean, for the first element analysis to be underway while the court is underway, the systematic one for the court to be uh, evolving both uh, old and new doctrines, and for these trials to take place in the complex of factual settings, which are extraordinarily complex. We heard Ambassador Rapp talk about the reduction of crime bases the other night. I mean, that with reduced crime bases, they are still factually of extraordinary complexity. So for the defense to be hamstrung by significantly inadequate resources, and the reason I believe, because we left uh, after about a year and a half, in part for resource reasons, in part because Wanda got her first case of um, malaria, um, we uh, wound up representing victims in the Darfur, where both the victims and defense counsel are faced with significant restrictions on resources. And while I think there's a problem when a prosecutor as fine as Bensuda has to say, we'll make do with zero growth, what does that reflect? Because the one thing I wasn't trained to do was to talk to the scores of diplomats that Juan and I have talked to over the past several years, almost all of them in private and in confidence, where they either about their own countries or others will say, there are some countries who are only concerned, as they should be, about shepherding their country's resources. There are other countries that are not as financially committed as they are rhetorically committed to the concept of justice and the challenge to impunity. And it seems to me that at that point, number one, to squeeze the prosecution function while expanding its situations and cases is obviously absurd on its face. What happens to the defense, and what I'm finding surprisingly, even to the victim function, where private counsel are concerned, where resources are similarly squeezed to the level where work cannot be effectively performed. Now, on the big stage, there are not ordinary folks in large numbers who really want to think about what the defense function is or why it matters. And even with victim representation, we find people not really able to comprehend how there can be a function that isn't appropriately functioned, financed. But at the end of the day, the quality of justice, in which Judge Thompson can take correct pride in terms of the jurisprudence, suffers tremendously when counsel, who by the way, I know of no lawyers representing defense or victims are getting rich or in this for reasons by and large less concerned about impunity or less noble than prosecutors. So at the end of the day, the voices that are associated with this organization, with the Carter Center, with this event, need to be as effective in talking about those other functions. And I think it's a deep conversation, not just a public one, but one that involves civil servants and diplomats, because the question that I suggested earlier was transformative was, are we at a point where we can declare victory and kind of go home? Or are we really prepared to devote the resources that are necessary for justice to be done? In ordinary trials, with ordinary crimes, in countries where the crimes are complex, the pretrial period can be years, the trials can last for weeks and months. Why would we not expect cases that involve thousands of events and incidents and hundreds of people 
and profound and complex legal questions to have a cost associated with them. I think that's an issue we have to meet head on, and I don't think that we can forever ignore that issue. Can I ask the panelists maybe to explore a little more this issue of the funding and the cost of the tribunal? Because when Ambassador Rapp gives us a figure of a quarter of a billion dollars to operate a court that effectively tries 10 people, uh, when we compare it with the Yugoslavia tribunal, which, what, 100 million a year for 20 years? Is that a, was, is that a ballpark figure for what it's worth? It's, it's cheaper. Uh, divide uh, divide uh, uh, 2 billion by the number of people who were processed by the Yugoslavia tribunal. If it was the same cost, it would be 8 times 10, 80. And it's much more than that, who went through the Yugoslavia tribunal. But when it was being set up, it was being vaunted as a superior model um, financially, but I wonder if that's the case. But David, in his remarks at lunchtime, pointed out also that when, the, when it was being discussed, and this was going to be funded by voluntary contributions by states who were prepared to support the court, that there were many reasons why that was troublesome. So here we are ten years later, you found the money. So. It worked, actually. You could look at it that way and say that you can do it. So I, I wonder if you can just reflect a little bit on that, uh, about the funding. Is that a model that could be followed again? Because I can imagine people in the United Nations saying, you see, you pulled it off once, you could do it again. And others saying, don't ever do that again with the, with the contributions. Binta Mansouri. Yes. yes. Um, before I get to the funding, my good friend Raymond raised uh, very interesting issues. Uh, I think uh, to respond to all of that would be beyond the scope of this panel discussion. And I look very much forward to an opportunity to have a constructive dialogue uh, with this Defense Council in terms of you know, the issues they raise concerning uh, adequate resources, which is all relative because I, I think this court stands out in terms of providing adequate resources, uh, not only you know, to the prosecution for uh, trying cases on behalf of victims, but also to ensure uh, due process and the rights of the accused. As I say, it's beyond the scope of this discussion. Talking about funding, yes, we found the money, but at a great cost. Sometimes it's not just headache, but a migraine. This, the special court, for us, it's all about financial crisis management over the years, where 2011 is the only year in 10 years that we had adequate funding for one year. It's been having you know, adequate funding for three months, then for four months, you go back to two months, and then you run all over the world. Time required to be on the ground, uh, to you know, provide the kind of leadership required in administration, uh, to support, to provide the support services to the organs. You spend most of that time on the road, uh, you know, seeking funding, go to the European Union, go, you know, come to the US, all over the world. And you know, even judges, the president of the court, get involved in that. It does question the credibility of the court. We have confidence in the credibility of the court, but it's all about perception. Our defense counsel in, uh, at the special court has raised this issue about oh, big donors providing money. It's a non-issue, but still is a perception issue. The reason why I say it's a non-issue, the money provided to the court is the money used to pay judges, prosecutors, and defense counsel. So that's why I'm saying it's a non-issue. Our budget, our annual budget, uh, has ranged from $16 million per annum to $36 million at the time we had all cases running. So in that sense, we are a very relatively you know, cheap court. But to say that because we found the money, it worked, I would you know, say it didn't work, although we were able to find money. As I speak to you right now, I sit here, we will run out of funds on you know, September 15th. That's not a way to run the court. So it's not working. We have to find a better way of funding these institutions uh, you know, in order to enhance the credibility of the institutions. 
And, and I would say at the moment, it's even more challenging. I mean, yeah. there are countries that were major contributors to the court that gave us millions that are now saying, well, maybe we'll give you 200,000. Yeah. And, and given the global financial crisis, I mean, if we were setting this up today, I don't think we could look forward to raising the funds that, that, that we need. So it, it, it's not a good model in, in that sense. On the other hand, uh, it may be uh, uh, the only model that you have available uh, to mm -hmm. you uh, because you don't have the, the, the the support to uh, to do it through assessed contributions, and then you've got to figure out uh, what 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 you can how you can change it. So you're saying, when Ambassador Carell says, "Don't follow the model of the extraordinary chambers," you'd say, "Please don't do what they did in Sierra Leone if you don't have to." If you don't have to, yeah. Yeah. Justice. Yes, so let, let, let me, in fact, um, in support of uh, Defence Council Brown, let me underscore the acuteness of the problem. I, I was one of those judges in trial number one who was adamantly opposed to responding to um, interlocutory motions brought be before the court by defense lawyers for judicial intervention in fiscal matters. We had about 10 motions asking us to intervene, to order the registrar to provide adequate financial resources for defense counsel, either because counsel had complained that the amount of money they got in their contract for this particular, the IUF case was a case in point. And constantly we did receive these interlocutory motions. And I, was saying, saying, I said to my colleagues, but how do judges determine whether the amount of money that's given to defense counsel in respect of support for the defense is sufficient or not? And is it within our jurisdiction to summon the registrar before the court and to ask her to, or him to provide all the details? We, the judges, were going to get into a difficult area of accounting and financing, which is not part of our judicial mandate. But somehow, in exercise of our so-called mysterious inherent jurisdiction, we're able to urge the registrar to do justice. And of course, we left the matter to the registrar and the defense counsel to negotiate the most acceptable compromises because Again, judges have been invited sometimes to get involved in matters that they are not trained for, that they don't even have any training. I don't remember when uh, I was at law school that I did anything in uh, fiscal sustainability, financing, and all that kind of thing. But it did indeed. But I, I, the, the point when I highlighted the doctrine of equality of arms, I really highlighted it in the context of the desire of the special court to ensure that its proceedings were in fact conducted fairly, impartially, and in accordance with established rules. I wasn't really adverting or alluding to the sufficiency of the resources to support the defense office. And I, and I, think this, I want to quote uh, right. Ambassador Rapp just briefly yesterday. Yesterday he said, this is a world of states. And it's not fair to somebody running, walking around writing down what you say to use it the next day. <laughs> but I actually agree because in both the courts that we've been involved, we had no quarrel really with the jurisprudence or with the registry, but rather with people who would tell us in confidence, look, we're constrained by the funders of this institution. That's what I'm saying. There's another model for which, quite frankly, I'm not trained, and quite frankly, no one listens. To, we don't, they don't even listen to us as um, counsel for victims, who you would think are sympathetic. I mean, they'll, uh, we've met with many staff members from many missions involved with the ICC who have been very receptive and talked to us confidentially, but we have no clout. Defense counsel has no clout. So the question is, who in the institution has the capacity to reach the states that are ultimately funded, some of whom are sincerely facing fiscal crunches, and some of whom find this is a convenient way to rhetorically support the concept of the challenge to impunity, but in fact subvert it. And I think that's the fundamental challenge that has to be at least talked about and thought about. David Sheffer. <clears throat> well, to add to all of the rich uh, points that have been made so far, no pun intended, <laughs> um, 
You know, we have, we have transitioned from a period in the 90s when we did reach tribunal fatigue, and that is what led to moving from an assessed basis to a voluntary uh, basis, moving it outside of the Security Council into an alternative formulation for creating uh, particularly the Sierra Leone and Cambodia courts. We've now moved very much into a, a period of donor fatigue. I experience this every single day. Um, part of my responsibility as the UN special expert on the Khmer Rouge uh, trials is to actually raise the funding for the international budget, <clears throat> which was $32 million for this year, and we'll only get close to about $26 million if I can succeed in raising $4 million more. We were going to go cash dry on the court three weeks ago for the end of August. We had no money left at the end of August for the court. Um, we've raised uh, since then about $5.2 million in pledges, some of which we know are going to get paid in soon. That gets us through to September, October. And <clears throat> I really share Binta's angst on this because it really is, it's become a month by month exercise. But I also, Raymond, I want to point out that part of my responsibility, and frankly, I, f I do it with great pride. When I sit down with a government, I tell them, I need money for the entire exercise and we need to understand what, what is required by this court that is quite different from how you look at budgets in your domestic justice ministries and judicial systems. You don't get the whole budget in front of you for what that costs, the building, the salaries, uh, the defense council, that all doesn't show up on your domestic ledger for your domestic justice budget. It does show up on this ledger and one of the items on that ledger is defense council and the only way we can remain true to international standards of due process in these trials is if defense counsel are properly funded to do their job in the courtroom because otherwise everything you're saying about the integrity of this court will be undermined unless the defense counsel are adequately resourced for this court. So that is part of the dialogue with governments that sometimes they don't quite latch on to the fact that we have the responsibility to pay for defense counsel fees. The clients are not generally paying for them. Uh, the court is paying those fees. So um, it's, it, I, I, just to get back to your original point, Bill, very quickly, you know, is this a model for the future? Every one of these tribunals, in a sense, is somewhat sui generis because of the, of the domestic circumstances. Even in the Special Court for Sierra Leone statute, you know, there are very unique provisions in there to deal with peacekeeper liability, with the liability of juveniles, uh, with the funding stream, uh, and uh, with even the seat of the court. Uh, and even on the translation issue, we actually got a great benefit out of this particular statute in that English is the only language that needs to be officially used by the court that cuts down enormously on a certain budget line for these courts, which is translation and interpretation. Right now, for the extraordinary chambers, I have to find every year $4 million to cover translation into French for a fairly small number of, of individuals who rely upon it in the court, and of course the Francophone world uh, who wants to read it in French. But that's $4 million every year that has to be found for the French language, um, whereas this one only has the English language. So there are those differences, and, and they do show up as you work through each one of these courts. Let me uh, ask if we can turn our minds now and our attention to the issue of the time frame of the operation of the court. I'm not talking about the period during which it worked but the period that it covers for prosecutions, what lawyers call the temporal jurisdiction of the court. It's something we don't normally think of in a national justice system because we assume that any crime that's committed here, more or less at any time in our lifetime, can be prosecuted by the courts. But in international courts, there's often, usually, there is an issue of the time frame. Even at the International Criminal Court, we have issues of time frame when situations are referred to the court. And there was a very recent, I think it's the most recent decision of the court in the Bagbo case. Judge uh, Cowell was one of the judges who participated in that, dealing with the interpretation of the scope of a, of a referral and the, the time frame that that creates. 
At the special court for Sierra Leone, uh, the time frame begins, we don't have an end date in the statute, but we have a start date, which is the 30th of November, 1996. It's not an arbitrary date, it's a date that was chosen because there was a, a failed peace agreement reached on that date. But actually, the conflict began in 1991. Uh, March of 1991 with the in invasion, the incursion into Sierra Leone by the Revolutionary United Front. In the Secretary General's report, to which David uh, Sheffer referred in his remarks at lunch, I think that's explained by saying it would overburden the court to have to deal with the period prior to the 30th of November 1996, which it's a, it was an odd explanation considering that we, this is a court set up to deal with impunity, and if it was going to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility, one might think that the court could figure out where it was going to focus prior to that date. So the question I'd like to ask is, what, what was the consequence of that? Did that hurt the work of the court? Did it result in the court delivering a, an incomplete picture of the Civil War, and the conflict in Sierra Leone? Was that a wise move in retrospect to, to do that? Stephen? Yeah, and, and I had to deal with the, the burden of it. And, and for instance, in, of course, Rwanda, we only had 1994, January 1st, and uh, in the media trial, we, in the end, weren't able to use the, the, the Hutu Ten Commandments, a horribly inciting document uh, published in Kangura, because it was published before January 1st, 94, yeah. and we were constantly in, in difficulty in, in dealing with the events that led up to the genocide because of it. And, the judges would try various efforts to maybe say, well, you could look at the conspiracy evidence, but you couldn't look at everything. You could look at the background. Uh, I think the mistake was replicated, though, with not quite such narrowing uh, consequences in, in Sierra Leone, with this November 30th, 96, because the war began in March of 91. And it was possible for Charles Taylor to take the stand and say, oh, of course, my forces went in there in, in, in March of, uh, of 91. And, and of course, there was all the evidence of the horrors that had been committed by those NPFL forces in, in Sierra Leone in 91 that people, people remembered. Uh, but uh, you know, then, of course, he could say, well, but we got out. 92, after that, I had nothing, nothing to do with it. And so uh, to a large extent, uh, you know, our hands were tied behind our back. In, in terms of being able to present the, the entire picture. It was important for background, but in terms of, of counts of conviction uh, and the evidence upon which an individual could be held responsible uh, for crimes, uh, it had to come after November, 90, uh, November 30th, 96. So I think it was artificial. It, if, if you're going to deal with these conflicts, if you're going to deal with a civil war, uh, you need to go back to the date uh, when, when that conflict began, or, mm. or, you're, or you're asking parties to go through contortions and, and to limit relevant evidence uh, from the consideration of the trier of fact. Justice yes. Bengali Thompson. Yes, quite. In, in fact, um, that issue of the temporal jurisdiction came before the courts, the trial chamber in which I officiated, in the IUF case when, um, at, in a very oblique way, when evidence by some prosecution witness was being presented which related to episodes and events that had taken place before the 30th of November 1996. And um, again, as I say, in a very vigilant and gatekeeping mood, the three of us decided to um, stand the case down. We went into chambers and conferred whether we're being ensnared into some difficulty here, evidence being brought out, which in fact relates to um, the time prior to the cutoff date. So I cautioned my colleagues that I'd have nothing to do with it, and I don't even want any exceptions to be canvassed by the, def the prosecution as to whether they can use this as part of history, I said this properly belongs to the kind of um, work that the TIC would be doing. My colleagues were initially of the view that, well, is it possible to use it to explain? I said, you know what? From an abundance of caution, let us get away from this particular area. It may, it may well be a snare for us. And that was how it came. And, and you're right, this was uh, once more, let me just venture <clears throat> with much judicial circumspection that this may well have been part of the 
the political ramifications that um, were at work during the negotiations as to how the court should proceed and what should be its temporary jurisdiction and what should be its personal jurisdiction and also the subject matter. You can see how everything was restricted in terms of the temporal and the personal jurisdiction. Of course, when it came to the subject matter jurisdiction, there was a broad scope. So again, judges once more, in, in, in a recognition of the sensitivity of the compartmentalization of functions, we were there to judge the cases, not to question the wisdom of provisions like that in the statute. And we, I think we did the best we could not to bring about any difficulty over that. Kind of well, thing. you've one of the godfathers of the court sitting next to you, and I'm going to have to give him the floor and ask him for a comment on this, David. Well, I, I would simply comment that, you know, my, my memory is not pr uh, perfectly precise on this very, very point of the start date, other than the general memory that um, we had, just as Judge Thompson just said, um, we were very focused on restricting the personal jurisdiction of the court um, to those with the greatest responsibility. And there was a political dynamic in that discussion such that if you're going to so restrict the personal jurisdiction, there would be good reason not to burden the court with opportunities that stretch all the way back to 1991, rather restrict the temporal jurisdiction to some reasonable period that would relate to those who would be suspected for rising up as, as possible accused during um, uh, the, uh, with the greatest uh, uh, responsibility. It was somewhat similar to the thinking we had on Rwanda in 1994. Believe me, we went through many weeks of discussions with the Rwandan government, which actually started uh, with the start date of the early 1960s. They wanted the Rwanda Tribunal to go all the way back to the early 1960s on its temporal jurisdiction. And finally, uh, you know, governments found that utterly intolerable because of the wide net that that might uh, ensnare the tribunal in. And so uh, it, it kept getting constricted more and more as the, year, as the weeks went by in the negotiations until it fell only within the year 1994 because governments felt much more comfortable with that in terms of what they were being asked to commit themselves to financially and otherwise in, in the future years. Intermatter. Yes. Um, the temporal jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction of the court, uh, it was one of the frequently asked questions by the people of Sierra Leone when this court was set up. Uh, because most people who were abducted victims, you know, the victims, they knew when they were ab abducted. So people were like, you know, how about us? Why is it only 30 November 1996 that this court is mandated to look at? Why is the uh, you know, mandate of the court limited only to those who bear the greatest responsibility? And what does that mean? Uh, the, you know, David Crane did help us to be able to respond to that question when he was going around the country uh, during the first year of the inception of the court by telling the people in community town hall meetings in rural areas that yes, you know, the temporary jurisdiction started 30 September 1990, November 1996, but what he was doing was basically telling a story. So we used that to explain to the people that yes, although it's November you know, 30, 1996, but your collective sufferings will be looked at because if you look, you know, uh, the sufferings abroad, uh, whether it's crimes against humanity committed, you know, from 30 Sep November 1996 or 1991, the fact of the matter is people will be held accountable, you know, for crimes against humanity or war crimes and so on and so forth. But that did have an impact on the people. The personal jurisdiction was the one that was, you know, trickier because decisions that are taken at the Security Council uh, for all sorts of reasons, you know, do have an impact on the people. And it became very clear to us at the special court, you know, that 
what was considered, uh, you know, those who bear the greatest responsibility by the decision makers, and even perhaps the prosecutors, was different from what the community members were saying in most cases, because the war, you know, spanned over a decade, and then people saw in their, you know, communities, next door neighbors, the perpetrators, you know, of crimes against them. So as far as they were concerned, those were the people who bore the greatest responsibility. So one of the questions they were asking us, why those people, how about these ones yeah, we're seeing here? Why weren't they brought to justice? Uh, of course, we did, you know, uh, respond to the question by linking their experiences, you know, uh, crimes committed by perpetrators, the ra you know, on the ground, the rank and file, with the leaders who bear the greatest responsibility for it to make sense to the people. But the point I'm trying to make is, yes, you know, these kinds of limitations do have an impact and have an impact perhaps that uh, may even survive the existence of the court. For what it's worth, I once speculated that the reason why the United Nations limited the jurisdiction to the, pick that date was because there had been, of course, an earlier peace agreement that the United Nations had endorsed and that included an amnesty provision without an objection from the United Nations. And perhaps there was a, a concern that this would be legally complex to go but, prior but, to that. But I have no evidence to support that. It's pure speculation. And from what David said, I'm, I'm, what I am pleased at is they didn't make the Lome Peace Accord of July 99 the start date and that we, wouldn't have, that we would have lost all the horrible criminal conduct of Operation Spare No Soul and No Living Thing and the attack on Freetown. Yeah, sure. That would have been devastating. So we're happy <laughs> that it was brought back to this rather quickly failed agreement of November 30th, 96, just as, a, as, a, as another date. And it, mm -hmm. and it did, I think, allow us to get in representative uh, conduct, but uh, in turn, and, and we were able to bring in as background and as similar acts evidence some of this, but as Judge, uh, Justice Thompson indicates, the judges were uncomfortable with that, and, uh, and, and it did, I think, make it much more difficult sometimes to prove certain counts uh, against individual accused. We had a temporal limitation at the Truth Commission as well, and we basically decided to ignore it. Uh, but then we didn't have defense counsel. <laughs> To, to, to disrupt that. Uh, now, Binta has, has, has sort of directed us to the next dimension of this problem of the jurisdiction, um, and both the jurisdiction but also the selection of defendants, which is this issue of those who bear the greatest responsibility. David Sheffer alluded to it in his remarks as well at, at lunchtime. Um, in the choice of defendants, which was made, I think, in effect, by David Crane and his team, but David bears the greatest responsibility for the choice of those who bear the greatest responsibility. <laughs> Obviously, that was his decision. And he did something very interesting in that he selected three kind of groups of defendants. Uh, later, we learned of Charles Taylor as well. But at the time, there were the three categories of defendants from the three combatant factions, if we can speak in this way. And I recall, because I was there at the time, that one of the choices was not very popular with many of the people in Freetown, which was the decision to, to prosecute the CDF, the, the pro-government militias who participated effectively in defending, as people saw it, many of the, defending them from the attacks of those who bore the greatest responsibility. It was a courageous decision on his part, I think, and it was quite remarkable. It's something that has plagued other uh, prosecutors and, and will continue to do so, particularly at the International Criminal Court where those types of decisions have to be made. So in hindsight, ten years or nine years later after those decisions, did, did he get it right? Was that the right mix? Um, was it a mistake to go after the CDF because they didn't ultimately bear the greatest responsibility? We can look at the sentences and say, well, their sentences weren't as high as those of the others, so that demonstrates that they weren't in the same category. So I, I'd like your reflections on that. Well, let, let me just jump in because it wasn't, uh, obviously when I became special court prosecutor, there were uh, the people who had been charged, I considered perhaps charging one additional person, but the decision was made by the, by the first prosecutor. And uh, my own view was that the decision uh, to prosecute Sam Hinga Norman, who is one of the most popular people in the country, frankly, the effective Minister of Defense, uh, 
uh, and uh, was, was one of the most courageous and important decisions uh, of the court uh, and, and, the, and the two other uh, co-accused. And uh, uh, I know your work in the TRC, I remember once seeing the sort of total of, of, of victims coming in talking about which groups had done it to them. And the, the groups that led the, the leading list was the RUF with thousands, but uh, also with thousands was the AFRC, and, and, and north of a thousand were, were violations by the CDF. Every other faction was way down, uh, uh, way down under a hundred. So there's no question that there was enormous crimes committed by certain elements of, of these organizations. And to some extent, the violence of the conflict was to some extent a reflection of one group being violated and then using that as an excuse to do something e even more brutal against the other. And so I think the idea not, and, and, and this is not to say that the CDF wasn't properly motivated in, 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 in fighting to, to restore the, the, the democratically elected government. It's not the whole CDF that was a joint criminal enterprise, et cetera, like perhaps the RUF was. But there were individuals that were involved in acts that, that literally went out as, as in Corabundo and said, well, let's kill everybody. Let's leave, as, as, as Ham, Sam Hinga Norman said in his speech before, the, before they went into Corabundo, I want everybody dead. I want every building destroyed except the bury the mosque and the school. And he was angry when there were people left alive. Uh, this was viewed as fighting fire with fire, but it's the kind of fighting fire with fire that burns every building and down and burns up every life. And so uh, going after, I think, both sides was key to, to, to justice and key to the, the, the sort of peace that we have in, in, in the country uh, today. And so I think it was extremely important, and I was proud that we were able to follow through and, and win convictions. And then when sentences were short, uh, uh, in the case of the two surviving defendants who were, who were convicted, uh, uh, to win uh, longer sentences on appeal. Justice well, Michael I mean, Thompson. I mean, my short answer would be clearly, I mean, it's, and again, speaking here, uh, not only judicially, but judiciously, I think it was a legitimate exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Yes, Raymond um, Brown. Yeah, I have no experience in selecting defendants for prosecution. Um, <laughs> but I do think that there is an interesting question that needs to be discussed, and maybe it warrants a conference of its own, and that is, outside of command responsibility, what are the theories of accountability by which we reach conduct that was reached at Sierra Leone through the concept of JCE, which we on the defense side saw as just convict everybody, but is really a joint criminal enterprise. Um, I like the Lubanga verdict because I'm a victim representative, but I think the concept of foreseeability as the touchstone is very troublesome. And what troubles me the most is the draft protocol statute for the African Court of Justice and Human and People's Rights, which would seek to criminalize unconstitutional change of government um, and make it in the context an addendum to the core crimes. Um, there are lots of other issues to discuss surrounding that court that I'm sure we don't have time to go in, but I don't know what the outer parameters of that are because it would seem to criminalize what we've always thought of as lawful conduct, that is, overthrowing a government, following the laws of war, and in a manner consistent with human rights, especially that government is itself engaged in violations of human rights. Um, it gets, and it seems to me that it may be a statute designed, I think, in part in response to the Bashir warrant. Uh, even though some of its drafters say no. Um, and it would seem to create a no notion of political impunity um, <laughs> that's quite dangerous. And I think that at some point, both scholars and again, the voices of prosecutors are critical, need to look carefully at what are going to be the outer limits of this kind of liability and how far should we go? Because I think um, that's a vain very dangerous place to go. Well, let, let me just respond to that quickly. Um, the, again, if you look at the literature, both the academic literature and the judicial judgments, uh, you do have um, uh, two schools of thought. Uh, one school of thought supporting your apprehensions that if the concept of foreseeability in the JCE is taken too far, we have an unruly horse that can cause so much damage and result in miscarriage of justice. Then there's the other school of thought which maintains that clearly it is quite, in, in cases of crimes against humanity, such crimes, war crimes, and other serious violations of international humanitarian law, the concept of foreseeability seems quite a logical thing to apply. And so it, it is, it, I see it as a kind of um, discussion which will get nowhere 
in terms of a resolution because we wrestled with that too as judges and I think in, in one of my own separate concurring opinions um, I did comment that it is possible to see how difficult this concept can be. It's not easy to formulate, of course, and it's equally difficult to apply. But I think we're, we're stuck with it until um, some kind of wise uh, judicial council or maybe some uh, divine intervention <laughs> may well guide us along the line. Well, since Judge uh, Thompson always treated us with such courtesy and fairness, I wasn't particularly criticizing his opinion in the no, 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 case. No. But, I, but I do think that since there were two dissents as to bow, both in the trial and the yeah. appellate court, and since this is an area yeah. that has to be handled with nuance, yeah. and I don't know that I can connect it jurisprudentially to the draft protocol, but the draft protocol is a pretty profound statement, and I think well beyond where we are now, but it raises some serious problems unless one is going to say as a matter of law, any time there's an armed conflict, we assume that without further proof, um, even though a person may not, may exercise command responsibility over troops, keep his own troops disciplined, that where there are some violations of humanitarian law, that person who started that conflict, if its purpose was to unseat a constitutional government, no matter how dictatorial it may be, no matter how much it may violate the laws of war, is a violation. I'm not saying that's what you said. But I'm saying me, that's a logical, I don't know how else they got to the draft protocol. And I'm well, not saying they studied your jurisprudence to get there. And, and, and we didn't get to the draft protocol. And I think this is an important distinction here. And I know there was, during the course of the of, a, of, a, of decisions on the JCE and, and the FRC case and then in the appeal, uh, some confusion about what was being alleged. And, and, uh, and, and the, in, in one sense, the judges uh, were right in saying if the, if the intention was to take over Sierra Leone, that that was the, the crime. Yeah. Uh, that's not a crime. Not a crime under, not a crime under the statute of the, of, of the tribunal. But what, uh, what was clear, according to, to our pleadings, was that uh, the way in which they were attempting to do this was through criminal means, through mass killing, through the terrorization of civilian populations, through enslavement to dig diamonds and enslavement for, and, and rape and, and, and other crimes. And this was part of it. And it was only because that, uh, you know, you had those crimes as essential parts of the JCE that if someone joined in it knowing that that was what was going on and intending that those criminal means be used and they took action to further it, then it's appropriate that they be held responsible. One of the difficulties about mass crimes, and I saw it in Rwanda and I see it other places, I mean, if you, if you try to think about this as like a, a crime in the streets where one person aggresses one person on the basis of wanting to steal something or some individual motive, uh, these crimes are quite different than that. There is a great movement uh, uh, which makes possible the killing of tens of thousands of, of, of individuals. And, and particular people in acting aren't necessarily the people that are there hacking people to death with machetes, but they're playing a role behind the scenes that is enabling that at the end of the day. And, and I would note that in terms of the decisions at, at, at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, I don't think, and I'll have to study it more carefully, but I don't think we've, that we actually went all the way to JCE 3, the foreseeability. Basically, the, the facts indicated uh, that because these crimes were ongoing over all of this period, and because everyone knew that there was rape and murder and enslavement and terrorization and use of child soldiers, that this was all, that all of these means were understood and within the contemplation of the actors. And so you didn't get to the level of foreseeability. I know Pro uh, Prosecutor Jallow spoke today of the Karamira case. This is, a, this is a case that actually, and it's now up on appeal, did involve sending out the Antero Hamway to kill people, knowing that, of course, sexual violence was happening all over the place and that there was this sort of victimization idea of the, of the, the, that the Tutsi women were responsible for destroying manhood of Hutus. And if you did that and you sent out people to kill, you could have foreseen that rape would be committed, even though you didn't intend it or it wasn't part of, of, of the plan. That, that's, that's, the, that's the frontier that's going to have to be decided by the ICTR appeals chamber. But in the, in the, jurisdiction, in, in the jurisprudence of, of the special court, it really had to be within the plan and within the understanding or there was no conviction. And let, let, let me just add that, in fact, whether we like it or not, we, we may probably once more here be on the borderline between morality and legality. The, the, the question for me would seem to be also um, 
whether if you, you may not have been part of an original plan, but you come in at some stage and you join <coughs> and you help to achieve the objective of the plan, where should your liability be begin and where should it end? But that's, that's, a, that's the, one of the complexities of the JCE. We are dealing with situations of plural criminality. And these are the peculiarities. It's somebody who just comes late in the picture, but yet does something to advance or promote the criminal design. Does he necessarily escape liability because he came late, even though he assists to pursue the criminal design with knowledge of the criminal design? These are the complexities. And, and, and a plural criminality poses its own peculiar problems of liability. I think for, for the benefit of the people in the audience here mm -hmm. who are not specialists in international criminal law, mm -hmm. the acronym JCE refers to a concept known as joint criminal enterprise, which is uh, kind of like an organized crime approach to prosecution. It's a very arcane debate that we could spend, several of us could spend the whole weekend uh, discussing in detail. But I'm going to suggest that we move on. Uh, I think Binta wanted to talk, you had another comment about the selection of the, yeah, of the well, candidates for prosecution. Yes, well just very simple, as you rightly said, this, is, uh, will, this will be an ongoing debate and definitely a legacy of the court that uh, academics and uh, you know all sorts of people would continue to discuss. Yes, you have to leave us that. Yes, for, for, the, for the people of Sierra Leone it's very simple. Uh, when the indictments were issued, the question was should people who fought a just war be indicted or not? So there was confusion, there was anger, and there was curiosity. And what we did was we Again, for good reason, the population, the whole special court con concept was a new, a new thing in Sierra Leone. We had to explain through our outreach programs how the court works. And so we had to explain to the people, yes, um, the court was indicting based on how people fought wars, not why the war was fought. And that question was asked for several years. Uh, again, I know we're running out of time, but the important thing is uh, the first two, three years where every corner of Sierra Leone, whether it was in the south, north, east, or west, people asked, why did you indict the CDF? Today, that question is basically not coming up at all. That shows the power of outreach and of explaining to the communities, engaging with the communities, how the court works. Because again, this cannot be an exercise for lawyers and judges as, you know, uh, because the issues are complex. So in terms of did we get it right? From the people's perspective, initially, it was a very confusing, you know, act by the uh, prosecutor's office. But eventually, the people understood why even those who fought, you know, just wars could be indicted. Mm -hmm. Can we um, look at a, a development that was referred to in last night's panel, and that was one of the more dramatic uh, events, the, the, the decisions by the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and that was the decision to move the Charles Taylor trial to The Hague. Um, uh, Stephen Rapp told us about w how much of a benefit it was for the court that it was actually there on site where the conflict took place and where the victims and the perpetrators and where everything was. And if I'm not mistaken, we were told last night as well that this was really at the demand of the, president, the new president of Liberia who was terrified of the trial going on there. There may have been other reasons. I think, was that under Sir Desmond's watch, the, the, that yeah. move? Mm -hmm. and so. In hindsight, was that, a, was that the right decision at the time? Uh, or would it have been, could it have stayed there? And, and well, we were obviously, it doesn't mean that we're criticizing those who made the decisions, but just looking back and saying, if we know what we know now, could it have been held in, in Freetown? I mean, I think it could have been. I mean, the, the security situation that I faced when I arrived there and the situation in the country were such that I think we could have safely tried Charles Taylor 
and, and, and done the trial there. The, the decision was made. Uh, uh, there were, at the end of the day, uh, some benefits to being at The Hague on, on, with, with the world watching this important trial, but there were certainly enormous costs in, in bringing people, uh, the, the witnesses that had to be brought there and, and protected and, and, and flown back. Uh, and it was also a challenge uh, to, to deal with, uh, with informing the public because, as you said, this was the great virtue. The other tribunals have been 500 miles and 1,000 miles from the scene of the crime. We were there at the scene of the crime. But, uh, but uh, through the outreach efforts, uh, uh, showing the videos up country, working with civil society in Liberia, one of the better projects was the, the, the BBC World Service Trust. Uh, working with them, we raised funds to bring three radio journalists from, uh, from Liberia and, and Sierra Leone uh, to, the, to The Hague. Uh, and every night they produced actualities for community radio across Liberia and, and, and Sierra Leone to such an extent whenever I was traveling in those places, I heard those broadcasts. And so it was possible, I think, to overcome, but uh, uh, it, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it, uh, we could have done it in Sierra Leone. Yeah, I take a different view. Yesterday I listened to Sir Desmond de Silva as he was explaining you know, the phone call from uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. But another dimension to that was really the feedback that we were receiving from the people of Sierra Leone. Uh, there were two you know, perspectives from the people, the business people at that time. Those who really had a lot to lose were very anxious not to have the trial in Sierra Leone because they were just starting to rebuild their lives, so they were afraid of trying Charles Taylor in Freetown, what you know, would be the consequences, the security implications of having a trial in Sierra Leone. So uh, then, you know, a decision was taken by the Security Council. Again, as I say, opinions were divided on that as to whether it was the right decision or not. But the majority of the people, of course, would have liked to see Charles Taylor tried in Freetown. In my view, I think it was the right decision uh, at that time because, again, we do outreach all the time, we are with the people. We are very familiar with the security apparatus in Sierra Leone and Liberia. The border is so porous. In fact, even before the trial was moved, we had influx of Liberians coming. No one knew where they were coming from. Security was very busy, you know, seeing people taking pictures and also. So the security implications, and for Liberia, that was just you know, starting their peace process, Sierra Leone trying to consolidate its peace process. I think it was a very tough decision uh, to make between peace and justice. In my view, the right thing would have been to, you know, the ideal thing would have been to hold the trial in Freetown. But at that time, I think the right decision was to hold the trial in The Hague. You know, so again, there's a tension between peace and justice right there. Part of it is David also, I just want to add the, the perception, and, and, and it's something that we constantly have to deal with. One of the reasons we want the, the Habre case going forward in Senegal, if, if we can, is that this, this argument that somehow this is Europe, this is somehow the North uh, trying the South, uh, this sort of neo-colonial argument that we've heard. And, and it's profoundly unfair to, to put that on the special court for Sierra Leone. But, uh, but the point is, if we had been there and, and people would have seen it being done uh, in Africa, I think that would have been a powerful message. Uh, and, and that's one of the things we forfeited. And uh, you know, we always joke that going to the ICC where we tried the case for the first two and a half years, uh, uh, no matter how many times we said it was the special court for Sierra Leone that tried uh, Charles Taylor, uh, the moment would come uh, that we would read in the press, and we did. CNN said, today the ICC convicted Charles Taylor. <laughs> they, uh, it, it, uh, going to The Hague, uh, created the impression this was being done by the ICC and not by us. Yeah, and not to yeah, be able to this point. Okay. Let, let, me, let me just put forward a, a hypothetical position. If catharsis is one of the objectives of trying cases involving crimes against humanity, etc., in the countries in which the crimes did take place or allegedly take place, then the question to put forward is, was that achieved in the case of the trial of Charles Taylor? In other words, if we agree 
that catharsis is a very important element that should in fact having the trial there would help the victims and their relations and the population of the country to appreciate that justice has been done and that what has happened is a moral condemnation and stigmatization of the offenders and that this helps the society to heal, then it remains a doubtful question whether the trial of Charles Taylor will in fact fulfill that aspect of it. Pinta? Well, as I, yes, as I say, um, I don't want to belabor this particular issue because the, the, the fact is, I think just for clarification purpose, all of us agree that the, you know, the trial could have been held in Freetown. But again, we cannot ignore the fact that we don't have the security apparatus to make that work. There is no way we can man the Sierra Leone and Liberia border. So the decision at that time, again, I wasn't part of the decision making, but for us, what was important is to achieve the objective of peace and justice. And I think the international community and the special court achieved that. Yes, there are downsides to it, but the decision, I think we have to do. And the bottom line is the court made it work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was the reality, and, and in so many of these situations, we face the global reality, we face the political constraints, we face uh, all of these concerns, and, and, and we work to achieve a just solution, and, and it was done here. David Shepherd, did you want to jump Right, in? I might just add a little perspective from the origins here um, on this issue of proximity and sort of amplify what Ambassador Rapp just said of the importance of proximity to the crime scene. We were extremely sensitive to this issue in considering where the seat of the court would be. And of course, the decision is it would be in Freetown, but we had to have an escape hatch for security purposes to some other location. Now, I have to say that uh, back in, in 2000, we were not contemplating The Hague. That did not, that really was not a subject of discussion that, that the court would be, the, the trial would be transferred to The Hague. Rather, it was where else in West Africa or to Arusha itself, the Rwanda Tribunal, could a trial be uh, transferred for security purposes. So that was really the, the gist of it. It was West Africa or, the, or Arusha. Now, on one of my trips uh, in the summer of 2000 to Freetown, I stopped off in Bamako, ba Mali, and met with the president of uh, Mali at the time, who was President Konari, also chair of the uh, 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 West uh, African uh, Economic Community, the community, Economic Community of West African States. And uh, during our discussion, I, I happened to mention to him that we're, we're trying to determine where else in West Africa could the court sit in the event of a security crisis in Freetown? Um, and would he have any suggestions? Because he was chair of the whole regional group. And he smiled very broadly. He's a very nice man. And uh, he said, uh, Ambassador Sheffer, follow me. So we left his office into a limousine and raced off at high speed over dusty roads to a hill overlooking uh, Bamako. And that hill was the defunct solar energy center of Africa. It was all built, office building, nice auditorium that could be easily converted into a courtroom. They had a, a housing facility that would be the jail very easily. Uh, they had an eating facility, but it was all closed because there was no funding for the solar energy center of Africa. Um, and, and we walked around, and he find, the pre President Konari finally turned to me and he said, Ambassador Sheffer, this is your alternative site for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. I give it to you. <laughs> it even had a barbed wire all around it, you know. And, um, and so uh, I floated this idea, of course, I, I thanked him profusely. Um, and I floated this idea when I got back, and, and it, did, it did not fly. But um, nonetheless, it was there. I have no idea whatever happened to the solar energy center of Africa, but it was a ready-built facility. Raymond, did you want to? Yes. Um, 
not about the location, but the bringing of Charles Taylor there, since my main preoccupation at life at the moment is the question of whether and how Mr. Bashir can be brought to Brook. You started off by asking about the issue of lessons and models, and the question is, were the events surrounding Taylor that we heard about last night and his apprehension so sui generis in terms of time and place and diplomatic alignment that little of that is useful in supporting a very fine prosecutor who has a task of doing it and some NGOs who are equally interested in other counsel? Or is there, are there lessons about bringing to trial someone who is a sitting head of state, apparently thinks he can act with impunity while under indictment, and who has some diplomatic support for not coming to trial? Let me ask about the most recent uh, development now of significance that the court, uh, Brenda Hollis described it this morning, which is, of course, is the conviction and sentencing of Charles Taylor. And we know that Charles Taylor was found guilty, uh, as, as Brenda described, of aiding and abetting and of planning, but not of the joint criminal enterprise part of the charge. In other words, the prosecutor got some of what she was asking for, but not all of it. And I presume this is a matter that's going to be litigated on appeal, and we can't predict the outcome exactly. But how important is that to the narrative that emerges of the conflict, of placing the role of Charles Taylor in the conflict as being the, the sort of the linchpin of the conflict, the man who bears the greatest responsibility, or more someone who may be on the sidelines or on the periphery? How important is that to the to the legacy of the court, um, and, and will it be satisfactory to have a judgment of aiding and abetting and planning, uh, or do we need, does that appeal have to succeed in terms of, of what the court leaves as a legacy? Anybody want to handle that? Or? Well, <laughs> Stephen. obviously we're, we're, we're awaiting an appeals decision and, and, and we can't anticipate that, but uh, as I said last night, I was enormously satisfied uh, by the judgment. Uh, obviously, uh, didn't find him responsible on each of the modes of liability, but the fact that, uh, that the judges did say that this, the aiding and abetting that he provided was so substantial that without it, it would have been impossible for these crimes to be committed. The RUF would have run out of gas, resources, and ability to do what they did in, in that horrible year of 98 and, and, and 99, and then also to be held responsible for the planning of, of, of really the most brutal campaign of, of, that, of that campaign of terror. And so I, I think uh, if, if, this is, if this is the final, uh, the final resolution, uh, I think it, it, it's, it's a success and, and a story is told. Of course, in every, in every case, I mean, Nuremberg, uh, uh, you know, there were three acquittals. You can go back and revisit and wonder about evidence and the responsibility of, of, of individuals. Uh, but uh, in a criminal proceeding, you never win everything. You, you can't see every event. You don't see every connection. And you have this burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and people don't expect a, a court to tell history historians do that. They establish a criminal responsibility based upon admissible evidence, appropriately challenged vigorously by the defense, and, uh, and, and, and then finally decided by judges, uh, both on a trial and on appeal. David Shepard? I would just add that uh, I, I, of course, defer to the prosecutors in terms of the significance of the ruling at the trial chamber and then what we may anticipate uh, at the appeals chamber for Charles Taylor. Uh, just going back to the 1990s, I would just say that, um, or from the perspective of the 1990s, I suppose, um, I, I was very uh, satisfied, at, at least with the, 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 the level of, of uh, accountability that was established at the trial chamber level. Um, uh, you know, when we were drafting the um, the statute, the, the, the point of it was to ensure that uh, Charles Taylor would be someone who would be investigated by the court. And we really weren't going beyond that in our expectations of what the court might uh, uh, produce with respect to uh, the results of that investigation of Charles Taylor. But we certainly wanted it to have the jurisdiction uh, to investigate him uh, for the crimes, uh, alleged crimes committed in Sierra Leone. So at least from a drafter's point of view or a negotiator's point of view, 
Uh, I certainly leave it to the prosecutors as to the significance of what has happened at the trial chamber, what may happen at the appeals chamber. Um, but it certainly, when I when I heard the uh, the the judgment, I certainly was not um, shedding tears. I, I thought, you know, that was a productive outcome from what our expectations had been. Thank you. Well, I think our time is is really up. We've scratched the surface of some of these important issues. Thanks to the organizers, Jim and David in particular, and the Chautauqua Institution, we have another day or so to to ruminate on these uh, subjects. Let me just leave you with a, with a parting thought about, about the special court for Sierra Leone after 10 years. We often ask uh, in discussions about international justice, what does this do, what do we accomplish, what's the purpose of it? And uh, part of it, at any rate, is to promote peace. And that's in the statute of the special court for Sierra Leone. And we'll never be able to know how much the Special Court for Sierra Leone contributed to the well-being of the people of Sierra Leone. But since it was established, and over this decade since it was created, Sierra Leone has been through the most prolonged period of, of democracy and peace in its history since, the, since independence. And, you know, I would like to think that maybe the court had something to do with that. So let me ask you to thank our panelists in the usual manner. Thank you very much. Um, certainly that could have gone on much, much longer, but fortunately you will have the opportunity tomorrow morning to carry on some of these discussions that started here this afternoon in our porch sessions. And I'll just mention a little bit, for example, we'll have a porch session about outreach, and Ms. Mansure is the architect of the court's outreach, an incredibly successful program. We'll have another chance to talk about the truth and reconciliation in one of the porch sessions tomorrow. So much of this can continue tomorrow morning and you'll have a chance. Uh, we're going to add one very short addition to the program here this evening. And Please just remain seated, although we won't ask anything of you tonight, but it might be easier. But we do have one person that we would like to bring forward to just make a few comments about an international criminal court training program. And this is the former president of the American Bar Association, Mark Greco, and we're going to offer him the floor for just a couple minutes to discuss this program. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm sorry to delay uh, our break, but uh, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to tell you about a project that I think is significant. Uh, I am Michael Greco, not Mark Greco. Uh, there may be a Mark Greco out there, but I'm Michael Greco. I'm, as Jim said, past president of the American Bar Association and chair of the ABA Center for Human Rights. And I'm very honored to uh, be able to speak with you. When uh, David told me about an hour and a half ago that I'd have a few minutes uh, to speak, uh, it brought to mind the man who was invited to speak and he has accepted the invitation and then was told that he would only have five minutes to speak. And the man said, how can I cover everything I know on this subject in five minutes? And the answer was, uh, speak slowly. <laughs> <clears throat> let me begin, let me set the table uh, this way. On November 21, 1945, in the Palace of Justice at Nuremberg, Germany, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, as Chief Nuremberg Counsel for the United States, made his opening statement uh, for the United States uh, in the case, the United States of America, the French Republic, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics versus Hermann Wilhelm Goring et al. Justice Jackson said, among other things, eloquently, the privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated that four great nations flushed with victory and stung with injury stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law 
is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. Despite the advances that followed the Nuremberg trials, the 20th century, despite the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other important international instruments, was nearly as bloody as the first half. Genocides in the countries that we have heard about for the past day, the horrific crimes have proven that the pledges that we heard after Nuremberg of never again, no matter how sincere and solemn, mean little without credible permanent force of justice for those who kill en masse. To that end, the American Bar Association, starting in 1978, called for the creation of such an institution, a permanent international criminal tribunal dedicated to ending impunity for atrocity crimes, to securing justice for victims, and by do so doing, deterring future atrocities. Twenty years later, in 1998, the ABA was among the key NGOs involved in developing the Rome Statute that established the ICC. And since 1998, the ABA has been calling on U.S. accession to the Rome Statute. And until that happens, for U.S. engagement with and support of the ICC's vital work. This year, having repeatedly issued calls for support of the, of the court by the U.S., the ABA, through the Center for Human Rights, which I'm honored to chair, has determined to institutionalize its commitment to the ICC and to international criminal justice. I'm therefore pleased to announce that the ABA, International Criminal Court Project, which will transform long-standing ABA policy into action, will be formally launched in October. It will foster greater U.S. engagement and cooperation with the ICC in three ways. Number one, after many discussions with the leaders of the court during the past eight months, I'm pleased to say that there is a will and a, and a support on the part of the leadership of the court to engage in steps to improve the operations of the court and the ABA is pleased to be part of that. One part of it will be education, education of personnel at the court, education of lawyers throughout the United States and other places about the work of the court, educational forums to take place in Washington, D.C. and other places where the stakeholders will come together, members of the court, U.S. government leaders, lawyers, defense counsel, to have honest, candid discussions about the work of the court, what it is, what it is not, what its jurisdiction is, what it is not. And thirdly, advocacy by the American Bar Association and its 400,000 members in the United States with our government on the importance of the work of the court. To guide these efforts and to maximize their impact, the Center for Human Rights is assembling has assembled, it's a work in progress, a bipartisan ICC project board of advisors comprised of eminent leaders in international law, diplomacy, and advocacy. To date, the following individuals have been appointed to the board of advisors. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice Patricia Wald, Judge Thomas Bergenthal, Ambassador David Sheffer, Ambassador Thomas Graham, David M. Crane, Ambassador Thomas Siebert, Ambassador Hans Carell, Professor Emeritus of Law M. Sharif Vassioni, former State Department Legal Advisor William H. Taft IV, former State Legal Advisor John Bellinger III, Director of the Planethood Foundation Donald Ferenz. Additional distinguished individuals will join this board in the coming months. The purpose of the Center's ICC project, the ABA's ICC project, is to dispel the myths and misunderstandings that have impeded robust and reliable cooperation between the United States and the ICC. By bringing together all the stakeholders on a regular basis to talk, debate, 
share ideas, express concerns, and listen to the answers, we believe that in time, the leaders of our government in this country will have a higher comfort level with the work of the court, the need of the court, going forward. I conclude with this. The ICC project of the ABA will say to those in the U.S. who have long feared or doubted the ICC the following things. Number one, that the American legal profession believes in the ICC. That the eminent bipartisan members of the ICC Project Board of Advisors believe in the ICC. That support for the International Criminal Court not only serves the interest of the United States, but safeguards the values that we as a civilized people have long cherished. That the world needs the ICC and that everyone in America should be comfortable with the ICC and its work. I invite each of you to join the ABA in the efforts that will be undertaken starting in the middle of October and will continue for the next several years. And I thank you, Jim and David, for giving you the chance to make this announcement. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay, before I release you back to the remaining sessions for the day, but we still have two porch sessions yet today back at the Athenaeum Hotel. And these porch sessions are brought to us by Clayton Sweeney and Clayton Sweeney's dedication to the education of young people. I believe Clayton is in here today. Are you still with us, Clayton? Okay, so Clayton has slipped out. But due to Clayton's dedication to young people and the education of young people, we were able to host these support sessions this afternoon. We will have two of them. One of them is with the prosecutor, where we have many, many prosecutors, where we have many, many students that are going to be attending that, as well as any of you that would like to. The other porch session is also going to be, I think, a very, very interesting porch session, and this is on the challenge of piracy. And at that porch session, we have Seychelles Supreme Court Judge Duncan Gaswaga. Now, I'm very sorry, but we seem to have omitted his bio from your list of bios, and I apologize for that. But I know that Professor Scharf and Williams will certainly detail his background and bio at the porch session. So I invite all of you to return to the hotel to the porch session. After the porch sessions, for those of you who are staying for the evening meal and program, we will have a reception and go into the evening meal. Thank you. Yes. Right here? <laughs> all the speakers. Okay. There's one more, uh, one more agenda for the speakers that have been here with us tonight. We're going to hold you back here, that are here with us for the few days. We're going to hold you here for one more photograph. We can never have enough photographs. And so thank you very much. So if you're a speaker or one of the participants, a moderator, please stay for a photograph. And the rest of you, the buses should be lining up. The buses are lining up. Is it raining right now? It's pouring. Okay, so a mad run to the buses. <laughs> Thank you very much.